Okay. Last last section of our lecture on uh, chapter 17. I'm going to talk about the Mexican-American War. Uh, probably part of uh, James K. Polk's plan to get California and and uh, the rest of that territory. Great map uh, on page 383 of your textbook that you'll probably want to get out and talk about um, as far as that goes. All right. Uh, first thing Polk sought to do was to buy California from the Mexican. And he, he sent an ambassador by the name of John Slidell. Okay. So in your in terms of your lecture guide, where it says Mexican-American War, 1846 to 1848, uh, Polk sought to buy California from Mexico. The Slidell mission is what goes in the first blank. Polk sent John Slidell to offer them $25 million to buy the state of California. But they weren't biting. They didn't want it. Right? It's you know, one of those things where he said, well, are you sure you didn't hear me right? I said $25 million. And like, uh, like we often do in the United States when we think somebody of a foreign language doesn't hear us, we just talk louder. Are you sure you didn't hear $25 million? And uh, the Mexican said, "No, we we hear just fine. We don't. We're not interested." Slidell said, "Oh, I see. And I guess we'll talk to you later." And uh, anyway, in fact, Mexico wanted Texas back from us. So not only did they reject our twenty-five million dollar offer for California. Uh, he said, oh, and by the way, we'd like Texas back from you guys, too. So, anyway, there was a Texas boundary dispute. And again, if you, if you look on your map on page 383, uh, there was a discrepancy as to where the border between the Texans, uh, between Texas and Mexico. The U.S. said the border was the Rio Grande River. And if you can find the Rio Grande River there. You see where that is? Whereas the Mexicans thought it was the Nueces River. And obviously there's a there's quite a little chunk of land in there if you if you check out your book and see that there's there's a huge difference there. US troops were sent to guard the border. One thing led to another, and the American version is that Mexican troops crossed the Rio Grande and killed sixteen American troops. And for that reason we declared war. Um, a lot of the Whigs were opposed to this war. They didn't want it. In fact, a very young congressman from the Whigs at the time said, I'd like to see proof. You know, there was some contention that maybe no blood was spilled at all, that this was just, we were making up the story to start this war. And, and uh, I'd like to see the spot where blood was shed, said the young congressman by the name of Abraham Lincoln. I, and we call these the spot resolutions. And Abraham Lincoln said, show me the spot where American blood was spilled before we start this war. All right. Now, last page of your notes here. It says, Polk sought a limited war and used a three-prong attack. And again, on page 383, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time uh, talking battles because there's they don't very few battles on the AP test. Uh, and if they do, they have to have extreme importance, like the Battle of Saratoga during the Revolutionary War. That one could be on there. But, but other than that, not too much. So just kind of skimming through these notes here. Um, the Bear Flag Revolt, John C. Fremont. If that name sounds familiar to you, maybe some of you went to John C. Fremont School. It's named after him. Captured California shortly after it won its independence in the Bear Flag Revolt. So... I think technically California had declared its independence from Mexico, much the same way that Texas had declared its independence, and then John C. Fremont took it over anyway. You can see that red line there. General Stephen Kearney, if you if you went to the Civil War reenactment, you went to Kearney Park in Fresno, and that's named after Stephen Kearney. They attacked along the Santa Fe Trail from seven, uh, Leavenworth, to San Diego or Los Angeles area. Uh, California by sea, 
Commodore John Sloat had uh, seized Monterey in San Francisco. And then two generals actually invaded Mexico, went down into Mexican territory. Those were Zachary Taylor. Uh, his nickname, if you want to put it down there, was Old Rough and Ready. And if his name sounds familiar, we do love our generals, and he would be uh, a president of the United States very, very soon. And Winfield Scott is a name that will uh, come back uh, a couple times. He's going to run for president at some point. His his nickname, not quite as cool as Old Rough and Ready, his name was Old Fuss and Feathers. Right. At any rate, both of those guys uh, invaded. And eventually, it was a very short war, 1846 to 1848, not barely over a year and a half that it took this war to get over. All right, And it was settled by what I like to know as the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo uh, was signed in February 2nd, 1848 by Nicholas Trist, T-R-I-S-T. Um, and I have this because he's the chief clerk of the State Department. And what did we get from the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo? We got United States letter A gained California, as well as modern day New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Nevada, and Colorado. All of that territory. And you can kind of see, I don't know if we have a map of that in particular. No, we don't. I'll show you when we get back. It's a huge hunk of land. Now, uh, we didn't just take it from Mexico. We uh, we paid them fifteen million dollars for the what you know you can call it. Uh, we refer to that as the Mexican cession. It's what they ceded to us in exchange for fifteen million dollars. Remember, we offered to buy California for twenty-five million, <laughs> and now we're taking California and everything else for fifteen million. And we assumed claims of the United States citizens against Mexico uh, of up to three and a quarter million dollars. Three and a quarter million dollars. Okay. So you might want to say that the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was very good for us. Okay. In fact, little story, I had a uh, student of mine who grew up in Mexico once. And he said, Strickland, I, got, I have a Mexican textbook. He goes, you want to hear how the Mexicans <laughs> take this treaty? And he brought his sixth grade Mexican textbook. And uh, it literally said, and para los que hablan en español, cuando los Yankees nos robaron de nuestra tierra. Cuando los Yankees nos robaron de nuestra When the Yankees stole our land. And that was printed in, in a Mexican textbook. So always two sides to the story, right? At any rate, uh, Letter C, the U.S. Senate, Senate approved the treaty, although it was opposed by what by the Whigs. We call them Mexican Whigs. Okay? Uh, and on the other hand, there were some uh, expansionists, some Democrats who said we didn't get enough land, that we should have gone, we should have taken all of Mexico and not just what we got in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. So can't please anybody sometimes. All right, results and significance of the Mexican-American War. And, and right next to that, before we get into letter A, I have that in a broad sense, Mexico, the Mexican War will, be, will lead to the Civil War. If we're drawing a timeline of events that lead up to the Civil War, and we are, it kind of starts right here. And we, of course, all the issues in the past about slavery, the Missouri Compromise, um, and we, of course, the uh, the tariff issues and all that, all that has part to do with it. But if we talk about the slippery slope, and if we were creating a timeline, it would start right here at the end of the Mexican-American War. Because, of course, uh, letter A, the issue of slavery will raise its ugly head. We got all of this new territory in the Mexican session, in the treaty, Guadalupe, Hidalgo. All right, and now the question becomes, so we got this new territory. Is it going to be slave territory or is it going to be free territory? Right. And uh, so the issue of slavery raises its ugly head. Okay. The Wilmot Proviso, uh, it's actually a law that was proposed, a bill that was proposed in Congress 
uh, said that slavery should never exist in territory uh, that we obtained from Mexico. This guy, David Wilmot, saw, saw the writing on the wall. He says, when we win this war, the question is going to come up. And his proposal, which uh, twice passed the House, but the Senate would not approve it, uh, said that there should be no uh, slavery in the new territory that we're going to get from Mexico. So, you know, and I would put three stars by that. That's that's one we see in terms of events leading to the Civil War. Good to know, for you to know, it didn't pass, but it was on everybody's mind even before the Mexican-American War got over. Uh, another result, letter B from the Mexican-American War, is that our territory increased by one-third, almost well, even better than the Louisiana Purchase, when you look at the amount of territory that we get out of the Mexican-American War. Right. Letter C, it was a relatively costless war, well, I guess a year and a half. 13,000 Americans died, but as the case is in most of our wars, uh, very few of these guys actually died from bullets. Most of them died from diseases, which was very common in the day before good medicine. Letter D, our U.S. feelings for manifest destiny increased. <laughs> All right, but now we had the land from sea to shining sea. Right, we had from the Atlantic to the Pacific. So we're going to start looking elsewhere. We're going to start looking south. And some guys would look to Cuba and some of the West Indies. Some guys would look into Nicaragua as uh, possibilities where the United States could move next. Since we now had the east-west uh, quadrant covered, now we're going to begin to look south. And particularly Southerners were looking south for more slave territory that they could gain. All right, so letter D, U.S. feelings for manifest destiny increased. Letter E, it's it's it here, class, or you know, pretty much a, a lifelong existence in the relationship between the United States and Latin America. Letter E, Latin America begins to view the United States negatively uh, as the Colossus to the north. Very difficult to say, I mean, we, that we've ever had good relationships with the Latin American countries. They usually see us as um, kind of a bully, the big bad neighbor to the north. The only reason we even hang out with them is because they're bigger than us, and if we don't, we'll get in trouble. So, letter E, Latin America begins to view the U.S. negatively as the Colossus to the north. All right. And last but not least, letter F. Uh, the the army that fought in the Mexican-American War uh, would be the same generals that lead each the Confederacy and the Union in the Civil War. So this was their proving ground. This is where they got their only really wartime experience before the Civil War. Um, so I put letter F, U.S. forces gained valuable wartime experience. Uh, the Mexican War is the training ground for the Civil War. Right? In this war, they fought together as teammates. Right? And they fought together against the Mexicans. And the next time that they would fight, they would be fighting against each other, the Confederacy versus the generals. Right? So that's it. That's the Mexican-American War. That, that completes Chapter 17 on, the, uh, on Manifest Destiny, this idea that... Uh, we need to have all the land, and, and don't forget, okay, highlights, I would say James K. Polk, Manifest Destiny President, came in with four goals uh, to his presidency, achieved all those four goals. He got California, Texas was gotten for him by Tyler, he lowered the tariff. By the way, there, uh, we mentioned the Walker Tariff, you have a great chart on page 380 of your textbook, uh, chart at the bottom that talks about you know, the regional interests, who liked the tariff and who did not like the tariff, and things that we already know. So I would check out that chart in terms of the Walker tariff. He restored the independent treasury that had been taken away, that Van Buren had set up, and we got Oregon between uh, us and Great Britain. At least we got half of Oregon uh, that, that we know today. So that's it.